Uh, I'm Greg Nedved, the president of the National Museum of Language, along with Dr. Jill Robbins, our chief technology officer, and Dr. Laura Murray, our chief development officer. We're very happy to be a part of this virtual summit. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, the way that we're going to do this is that I'll speak first, then Jill will go next, and then Laura will finish up. And we hope you can see us, and we hope that you can hear us. We are, as the slide says, a virtual, a movable, and an outreach museum. Virtual means that we don't have a building at the moment. We are totally online. Movable means that we have items on loan to libraries, government organizations, other museums, et cetera. Outreach means that we, have, that we are constantly offering services to the public, or at least we're trying to. This is a new mission statement for us. The National Museum of Language honors and supports language acquisition, utilization, and preservation, along with linguistic and cultural diversity. Through our outreach activities and online resources, we celebrate the magic and beauty of human communication. The idea for our museum originated in the early 1970s, 1971, according to the screen, when a National Security Agency linguist, uh, Dr. Amelia Murdoch, decided that she wanted a museum dedicated to language that was free of government control. She took this on into retirement along with some colleagues of, of like minds. And in 1997, 1998, the National Museum of Language was officially born. Uh, we opened our doors to the public in 2008 in College Park, Maryland, uh, in close proximity to the University of Maryland, although we were not officially uh, affiliated with the, the university at all. At the time, we were one of the very few museums anywhere, and certainly within the United States, that was dedicated to languages across the board. We attracted both national and international uh, attention at the time. In 2013, we made the strategic decision to close our doors and become totally virtual. There were hardly any totally virtual museums anywhere in 2013. So we went from being a unique museum in one way to being a unique museum in another way. It was not an easy decision for us to close down our physical building, but given COVID, it, it seems as if we were ahead of our time in our, in our thinking. For the record, our goal still remains to return to a brick and mortar facility. Museum. Everything the museum does falls under one of these three categories. The universal aspects of language is pretty broad. I like to tell people that it can range anywhere from language construction, con, you know, conlangs, for example, Esperanto, to left brain, right brain study of language acquisition. Our, our speaker programs reflect this variety. Language in society is what you can do with the language. For example, teach, do government translation work. We offer information uh, to teachers as well as provide information to people looking for language related jobs. Finally, languages of the world focus on individual languages. Um, for example, Arabic or Swahili. We cover many individual languages in our speaker programs. Essentially in a nutshell, we're a museum dedicated to languages across the board. If it is language related, we are interested. This is what makes us unique. No other language museum is quite like this. Okay, outreach, a big one for us. Education, until recently we had summer language camps. Uh, COVID put an end to that. The speaker series is named after Amelia Murdoch, uh, who I already mentioned. Hosting speaker events is our longest lasting activity since we were doing it before we actually had a building back in 2008. We've been doing it for a long, long, long time. I mentioned the movable museum earlier. We let libraries, other museums, et cetera, know what we have available and they will display them to the public. We of course are also very active on social media using all the common tools, the tools everyone's familiar with, Twitter, Facebook, Etc. What you're looking at is the world's only international flag of language, which our museum created in 2008. That's Deborah Keefe, the, one of our trustees who sewed it. The winning design came from a worldwide competition of students. The winning entry actually came from New Mexico, a student in New Mexico. 
The three shades of green that you're seeing there represent past, present, and future languages. The tree, of course, is an easily recognizable language symbol. We're all familiar with the language tree concept. And the flag is now our logo. You can see it on our homepage and throughout this PowerPoint. Okay, at this point, I'm going to pass uh, the baton on to Dr. Jill Robbins. Uh, thank you for your time. And again, thank you for inviting us. Even before there was a museum open to the public in 2008, the museum has been hosting speaker events. Speaker presentations have run the full gamut of topics, ranging from Esperanto to Chinese poetry, from a live Amharic painting demonstration to updates on Native American language revitalization. We have been virtual for the past two years, but hope to move to hybrid events soon. You can see videos on our website of recent presentations, like the one on crossword puzzles, as given by Mr. Tom McCoy. He has had 33 puzzles published in the New York Times. You can listen to children's stories and folk tales in 17 different languages in our Sharing Our Stories exhibit. This project grew out of a request for multilingual storytelling as part of the Gaithersburg, Maryland Book Festival. We have found these stories to be useful in heritage language programs as well as a means of inspiring young people to explore a variety of languages. The museum has partnered with DARE, the Dictionary of American Regional English, in showing how this dictionary was created. The DARE research project consisted of face-to-face -face interviews carried out in all 50 states between 1965 and 1970. Graduate students, primarily from the University of Wisconsin, conducted these interviews and made recordings of speakers in communities across the country. The stories you'll find in our exhibit are based on the field workers' memoirs. In this exhibit, you can read the stories of the field workers, hear samples of regional English in the Arthur the Rat story, try your hand at a simulation game, or test your knowledge about the field workers' experiences. We are pleased to share a weekly podcast on how the Spanish language is used in Puerto Rico. It is delivered in the Spanish language, and the creators, our trustee, Dr. Luis Green Rodriguez, and Dr. Ida Verne Vargas, will be presenting at the annual conference of the American Association of Teachers of Spanish and Portuguese in San Juan, Puerto Rico, in July. The Philogelos, typically translated as the Joker, or the one who loves laughter, is an ancient Greek collection of approximately 265 jokes. Dating to the 4th or 5th century of the current era, it typically bears the title of the world's oldest surviving collection of jokes. Our associate and Latin teacher, Linda Thompson, created these cartoons from the collection. And you can listen to some of them in a video in which Catherine L. Bradshaw reads them in ancient Greek. Hello, everyone. It's um, a real pleasure to be here and have the opportunity to share information about our museum with all of you. Uh, I'm going to discuss for a few minutes our newest exhibit, called The Power of Poetry and Resisting Injustice with Language. And as you see, we have poetry from quite a few countries, um, 14 countries right now. Those are in green on the map and a number of languages. Um, and all the poems are related to social justice themes such as authoritarianism, colonialism, gender issues, economics, and identity issues. And we present the poems again in a bilingual fashion, similar to the Sharing Our Stories exhibit. The poems are presented in the original language, in text and in voice, so you can hear them. And we also have English translations. And some of the poems are actually songs. In that case, we have the text, then the voice, and we have uh, the music as well so for you to enjoy. So uh, this is a contemporary exhibit. We have poems from ancient times up to the present day, including, for example, Ukraine, what's going on in Ukraine right now, 
very contemporary. Uh, and so a good, a good opportunity for teachers and students. How's our museum structured? Well, we have a board of trustees. That's about a half a dozen people. We are the ones who basically uh, lead the activities of the museum. Uh, we have associates who were former leaders of the museum and are not involved on a day-to-day -day basis, but do assist us uh, as needed. And then we have a national advisory council of well-known language experts from around the country who also give us advice and support us in uh, that, that type of way. So uh, we get a lot of help. Thank you. One of our newest initiatives, this started uh, last year in 2021, was to expand the scope of the museum in terms of its reach around the country and internationally. We started a liaison program that has been very successful. We now have liaisons from 36 states, about three quarters of the states in the United States, as well as one territory, that's Puerto Rico and the District of Columbia. And we have four foreign countries. You can see um, the UK, Poland, Spain, and France right now. Uh, and these people who have volunteered with us to be liaisons for their states are really outstanding people. So we call them our Language Leadership Council. We meet quarterly and they provide uh, advice for us. We've gotten a lot of good ideas and well as support on content. So on the website, we have information from around the country and around the world through our liaisons. Uh, we have a section called In the News, and we also have another page that says Resources. And so you can find out uh, a lot of things that are going on in the language world from our website. And if you want to be involved with this, as you can see, we have still 14 states. We don't have liaisons. So we're looking for liaisons from the states that are not uh, in green uh, to be join us and represent their state. We welcome inquiries about that and volunteers who want to assist. They may not want to be a liaison, but if you want to assist some of our programs, we welcome that as well. Now, how are we funded? We have memberships. We have paid memberships. They range from $25 up to uh, oh, about $120 for a supporting membership. And then we have people who give larger donations um, we also apply for grants, and we have um, a book called The Five-Minute Linguist, which we were involved with developing. We get royalties from that every year. So our biggest grant so far was called a SHARP grant, and this was money from the federal government funded through the American Rescue Plan of 2021, and they had a carve-out for supporting humanities in that grant. And we were fortunate enough to get a $10,000 grant, which for us is a lot of money, uh, but to help us with our programs. We generally rely on volunteer efforts. It's one of our challenges. We have great volunteers, but um, it's also limiting and relying on grants and memberships that we don't know how many are we're going to have from year to year. It's sporadic. So we need to have a stronger and more stable source of funding uh, in order to continue to build out our programs. Space is an issue because we don't have a physical space, but as Jill mentioned, we are initiating a collaborative arrangement with the public library system in Prince George's County, Maryland, which is going to allow us to use some space in one of their 15 branches. It's a large system. Uh, to have some activities. So this will be a step forward for us. So our future plans, as I mentioned, we're trying to secure stable funding. And what will we do with that funding? Well, we'd like to hire some museum professionals uh, to help us with our programs. We don't, right now we have professional language specialists. All of us are involved, have had a deep experience in learning languages, teaching languages, managing language activities but we don't have museum backgrounds per se. So that would be a great support for us. Um, we're also forming national and international partnerships. We mentioned the liaison program. So in addition to liaisons from states, we're developing partnerships with other national uh, organizations such as the American Translators Association, uh, the National Foreign Language Center, 
and some others. And we have international partnerships with some museums around the world, such as the uh, Canadian Language Museum. And uh, there's a Mundo Lingua in Paris and some other organizations that we uh, have a partnership with. So it's not formal relationships. Uh, we're continuing to build out new exhibits. You mentioned the poetry exhibit. Another exhibit we're working on, which is not quite ready, but will be a lot of fun for people once it's up there, is a virtual cruise to Puerto Rico. This is gonna be a really exciting exhibit. It'll be like getting onto a cruise ship and then you have the opportunity to take uh, shore excursions through the website, which will take you around to see some really interesting places in Puerto Rico, uh, as well as experience uh, the culture, learn more about their foods, their music and arts and uh, issues in Puerto Rico. We, we think it's important to highlight Puerto Rico. It is a part of the United States, and but it's a part where main language is not English. So how can we work together? Well, as we mentioned with through our liaison program, we're interested in attracting more liaisons so we can completely fill out this map. So people who are interested in working with us are welcome to contact us at info at languagemuseum.org. There's our website there. And if you wanna be involved with the museum, but don't want to take on the responsibility of being a state liaison, we have a lot of volunteer opportunities to participate in our exhibit development we also offer paid internships for students. It's a limited number, but we do uh, try to be good supporters and we pay our interns $15 an hour for working with us. So for the interns, we're looking for people who do have foreign language skills and some uh, good computer skills as well, who like the experience of working with the museum. And I think with that, I'm going to close my presentation. Thank you all very much for your attention. And we look forward to hearing from you.